So, to the business at hand. Uh, following what I th think was a, a, a wonderful um, discussion yesterday um, by Brenda uh, of uh, a Christian poetics, um, we we had the good fortune of uh, of uh, sharing a further discussion over dinner, and uh, the the number of sort of Christian and Islamic resonances uh, that were emerging already uh, at that point were uh, were just fascinating to uh, to think about, um, and so with that in mind, it's just my great delight to introduce our second plenary speaker. Um, one of the the goals that I've had as uh, director of the PMR conference has been to bring people who should be talking together and don't often have the chance to, together. And uh, among those, I count um, scholars of medieval Judaism, medieval Islam, uh, classical Islam, and uh, medieval Christianity. And uh, so I wonder if we might be thinking about uh, starting with a conversation about Christian poetics, um, hearing a bit about Quranic poetics, uh, uh, today, uh, and so begin to think about what, if there is, what's a scriptural poetics look like, uh, and is that even the right term? Um, but to uh, offer us some thoughts in at least the first direction, if not the second, is uh, Michael Sells. Uh, after spending over uh, 20 years uh, teaching at ha right down the road here at Haverford College, uh, Michael is now the John Henry Barrows Professor of Islamic History and Literature, and a place that I'm quite fond of, the Divinity School of the University of Chicago. Uh, he's author of several books, many will know, uh, Mystical Languages of Unsaying, uh, and Approaching the Quran, but that's just two. His interests are uh, are are. Uh, wide. Uh, it, the scope of his interest is wide. Um, and above all, he, I know I was just speaking, um, uh, well, I had email correspondence a few weeks ago with, with Amy Hollywood, uh, who's a former student of Michael's. And, uh, and we were just speaking, she spoke to me of the ways in which uh, Michael has just always been a generous uh, teacher and colleague. Uh, so a great scholar, a generous teacher, and a good colleague, I present to you Michael Sells. I want to thank uh, Kevin for um, your generous introduction and for this marvelous uh, uh, conversation that's been set up over the last two days. And to thank all those uh, whose uh, talks I've been able to attend and who have participated and asked questions. It's been an extraordinarily um, moving um, set of uh, discussions. And I want to thank especially uh, Brenda, De uh, Brenda Dean uh, Shieldgen for her extraordinary talk yesterday. I was saying to Kevin that, um, you know, the, it's, it's just such a joy to hear a talk that has that um, amount of um, intellectual and literary excitement uh, carried through at that level. Um, and it really, um, I think what it's, uh, it's a wonderful uh, way to uh, set uh, a number of issues on the table that I'll just be discussing uh, today, uh, not by any design and not that I went back and redid uh, anything in view of Brenda's talk, but I, I will make some comments um, I imagine most of you have probably heard the talk, but just in case, I'll make some comments about it just to fill in the gaps during my, uh, my presentation. And um, I'd like to leave plenty of time for discussion. So Kevin, if you could give me some signals. Um, I'm really bad at timekeeping, so 
just raise your hand when there's 10 minutes left to go in my talk, please. And, um, and if, I go, if I go beyond that, you know, you got to be tougher than these moderators at debates and stuff. <laughs> you know, just get out the big thing and, oh, okay, thank you. I can be tough, just let me know. All right. Uh, so I'm going to start out by talking about spirit, desire, and inspiration in the uh, Quran and Arabic and other Islamic poetic traditions. Let me begin by um, uh, some comments that the uh, Quran made about poets. Alam tara ennahum fi kulli wadin yahimun. Don't you see that they are wandering, um, uh, wandering lost, or wandering love lost in every wadi? Wa ennahum yakuluna ma la yafalun, and that they say what they do not do. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَذَكْرَ اللَّهَ كَثِيرًا وَانْتَصَرُوا مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا ظُلَمُوا سَيَعْلَمُوا الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا أَيَّ مُنْقَلِبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ Except for those who believe and do right, Remember God continuously and come to victory after they have been oppressed. Those who have oppressed them will know what kind of reversal they will suffer. So here we have um, a statement that seems very critical of poets at first. It says they're wandering love lost in every wadi. They don't do what they say, um, except for those, and this is common throughout the Quran, except for those who um, uh, believe and do right, do good works. And, but here it's more extended, and to shorten it, who struggle against oppression and overcome it. And um, it reminds me of something that uh, Brenda was mentioning about Dante, how Dante had this lyricism, but was all, also said that he didn't want uh, to fall to the sirens, um, to the siren song, and so that the lyricism in the Divine Comedy had to be brought together with this prophetic voice, uh, this voice of action. And that's something one sees in the Quranic discussion about poets. It's common to say that the Quran uh, had a low view of poetry, but many would, many I think poets in the Arab tradition would look at this and say it's just a description of you know what we do. We do wander love lost in every valley, and that's the theme I'll be talking about today as part of what poets do. The Quran also makes distinction about poets speak from desire, hawa, whereas um, uh, Muhammad receives a revelation that's revealed. And it's clear throughout the Quranic texts that people had come to Muhammad and said, you know, first of all, to have powerful speech in, in the environment that we know of from the Quran and from anything else we know about that period in, uh, of Arabia, uh, to have powerful speech was to be taken with great seriousness. And uh, so people came to Muhammad and said, you must be a poet, because the speech of the Quran was so powerful. And the Quran makes uh, several special digressions to say that poets speak out of Hawa, uh, this is a revelation revealed, and we'll talk about some of those passages. In the uh, developed vocabulary of pre-Islamic poetry, 
the poet uh, did not author uh, the verses. The author of the verses was, were the jinn, uh, the equivalent of the muses. Um, the, the poet became possessed by the jinn who composed the uh, words that the poet would enunciate. Jinn were um, associated with love, madness, and uh, poetic inspiration or possession. And the three were seen to have gone together. Uh, and the, uh, another point, the, the Quran makes a point of talking about the revelation to Muhammad and saying, your friend, Sahibakum, is not Majnun. He is not, the word is translated as, as crazy or mad, but it also, it literally means to be taken over by the jinn. He is not jinned in that sense. The, uh, so the Quran defines itself carefully as not being poetry. And uh, at the same time, it's clear that the Quran is by all notions of poetic language, a deeply uh, uh, po uh, poetic text. Uh, it operates on an extraordinary level of, of what we might call poetic features that cannot be translated into normal prose. I'd just like to give a few that I've talked about in more detail elsewhere. Uh, it is not poetry in the sense that it is not constructed in strict meter, the quantitative meters of, of classical Arabic poetry, or strict rhyme. It uses a very supple rhyme scheme, uh, and the lines can shorten or lengthen. Classical Arabic poetry was, was uh, each line had to be the same as another line, like Homeric epic. Um, the, uh, Quran, the line, the, the line rhymes can vary from short, um, very, very um, rhythmic, uh, hymnic type of quality to break out into very long lines, um, into a more homiletic, even more expository discourse, suddenly uh, uh, twist back into the, the uh, more rhyming incantatory style. Uh, the uh, a modern uh, poet, one of the most important modern poets of the last decades in the Arab world, the Syrian poet who writes under the name of Adunis, um, has written that for modern uh, poets, um, the tradition of the classical poem and the, and the Quran are the two key inspirations. And he finds that the Quran is the element of freedom and musicality and uh, a certain kind of liberation uh, or openness, whereas the, the classical poetic form it offers um, a sense of shape, a sense of tradition, and a sense of discipline. That's one particular theory, but I think it just shows how contemporary poets today are viewing the poeticity of the Quran. So, one of the things that's always difficult to do is talk about the Quran's uh, musicality and its poeticity without using the word poetry or music. Um, the Quran is not poetry. Um, and I often give interviews where I go out of the way to talk about how the Quran is poetic, but it's not considered poetry for the reasons I just mentioned. And of course, those are lost. And then there's a, a little blurb that says, Sells gave a talk in which he said the Quran was great poetry. <laughs> Uh, and, and of course, that phenomenon makes it all the more difficult for uh, Arab and Muslim writers to talk about the poetic elements. And they are central to understanding what is called Ijaz al Quran, which is the notion that the miracle that Muhammad had was the Quran. Um, the Quran has several representations of people coming to Muhammad and saying something along the lines of, OK, so you say you're a prophet, and you're bringing the words of God. Um, Moses was uh, um, a prophet, and he had miracles. And the Quran recounts them. He throws down the staff, and it uh, devours the Pharaoh's magic. And um, you know, uh, Jesus had miracles, and the Quran pronounces them. He brought, made birds come to, clay birds come to life. He raised the dead, etc. Where's your miracle? 
And the answer the Quran gives is, this is the miracle. If any human being can create, and the Quran is, uh, Muhammad is not a prophet, and the Quran is not the word of God. But if no human being can create anything like it, then um, that's testimony in itself. So this notion, which is called Ijaz al-Quran, the inimitability of the Quran, becomes a central um, authority for the Quran. The Quran's authority is in what is called the Nizam, the, cons uh, the construction, uh, um, the beauty, uh, or the inimitable way that the, the language and the meaning of the Quran come together. Uh, not only is the Quran then um, uh, a, a theologically self-conscious act of, of, of um, special creativity in language, but it was, it's also learned in that way today, and according to all the traditions, this is the way it was propagated at the time of Muhammad and beyond, as an oral tradition by Quranic reciters who, ha who undergo extraordinary tra training, even till today, to pronounce it uh, in rules that are called tajweed, the rules of recitation. And these involve um, uh, what one would what, what call, the most, as far as I know, the most elaborate rules of poetic elisions that um, uh, can be imagined. Every consonant, uh, depending on what comes before it and what comes after it, can be pronounced in one of several different ways. And l little skips can be put in or should be put in. Vowels should be elongated to either twice their normal length or six times their normal length under certain circumstances. And if one does not do those things, not only is one not actually articulating the Quran uh, properly according to the rules of Tejweed, but it uh, is actually quite jarring to people. Um, uh, if one is a Quranic rec reciter. Um, personal experience, I was in Damascus and uh, uh, I went to a shrine there of uh, a Sufi named Nabulsi and I heard this beautiful Quran recitation and I was with a friend, a Tunisian friend, and we went in and asked if we could sit in with the Sheikh. He was reciting. There were young boys there, eight or nine, there were people like uh, mechanics who drove all the way across Damascus or took uh, buses all the way across Damascus after work to uh, 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 learn uh, Tajweed. There were about 15 of us. You know, the, the uh, sheikh would give lessons on how to pronounce these various uh, illusions. He would recite a verse, and then we would recite after. He would call on us. We would tremble, and uh, come, there was a young man who had sold all his property to come from Nigeria and dedicate 10 years of his life to learning how to pronounce the Quran. And we, um, what we found was, first of all, it doesn't matter whether you're Arab speaking or not. Native Arabic speakers have no big advantage. Um, the Quran, most of the Arabic language gloss over phonemes, switch phonemes around, cut off the grammatical endings, um, and uh, so the Arabs are having just as much trouble as, as us non-Arabs, and uh, none of us are getting close. And, and when we make a mistake, it's like scratching the chalkboard. There's this total sense among the audience and among people that these things are really clear. You can hear when they're done properly and, and know when they're not. And when something is at that level of immediacy, I think it shows that the, the orality of the text and what I would call aspects of its musicality and poetics are absolutely central to the way people take it in uh, and what I would call take it to heart uh, today. Uh, so that really means that translations in English, not only is there a kind of doctrine that it can't be translated into English, although there have been some exceptions we heard about today um, or into other languages, um, and there's a hesitation to use translations for that doctrinal reason, I think there are also reasons, even as a translator, who knows that nothing can ever be translated completely and that poetry is always impossible. There's, there are special problems in translating the Quran uh, that make it, uh, you know, just a, a different. I'm not saying that 
confirm the miraculous nature of the Quran, as I was accused by some anti-Islamic websites of saying. I'm just saying that when one has a sense of it, it gives a better understanding of why uh, uh, the notion of inimitability of the Quran, its, its self-validating nature as a, as a source of, uh, of beauty and power, um, is, is something that, uh, m uh, that makes an at least a plausible suggestion that people might take up. That is not, I don't think that's available in the translations. Um, the Quranic uh, 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 poetic aspects include what I call sound figures. Sound figures were, would be uh, 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 grammatical endings, uh, interior uh, rhymes, uh, that uh, come together in ways that often break down or shatter the, um, uh, the lexeme of the language, its notion, notion of separate words, and often um, it bring together all, uh, uh, the female grammatical ending, ha, is, is very similar to a lot of the expressions for um, uh, sighing or being impressed as an interjection. And it, it's also um, related in the Quran in extended rhythmic patterns uh, to a whole series of things that where you can take a word like um, hawiya, which is a word, uh, there's a whole surah de dedicated to the hawiya, which is uh, one of the apocalyptic surahs. And the ends are, are malaha, uh, 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 so that the ha in um, uh, will say it or what is with her, etc., the female grammatical endings on the one hand, and this ha within hawia, in the analysis I've done, they've come together and they create a matrix of meaning, and then they resonate into uh, that matrix of meanings resonates in other places in the Quran, not in that surah. We were talking today about the creation uh, images and the, the notion of rule, and I'll, t I'll talk about how this sound figure works in that way. Uh, like all, like many languages, but not English, uh, Arabic works according to grammatical gender. Everything has to be either fa uh, male or female, with the exception of about eight words, one of which is the word for spirit. Um, so a, a table is male or female, etc. The earth is, is grammatically, the earth is grammatically female, the sun is grammatically female, and in the surah of the sun, uh, you have a whole series of female grammatical endings, the soul is grammatically female, that build up with one another, and to create what I would call a partial personification. That there's a, a, a sense of a fee, uh, um, more than simple grammatical gender. It's as if the Quran shaped the power of the grammatical gender into something beyond it, but not into a pure personification. So when I translate it, or anyone translates the Surah of the Sun, or uh, the Surah of Zelazela, the earthquake, when the earth will reveal her, her secret and bear forth her news after people say what is with her. Um, all is the language of birth, giving birth. Malaha is something people would say today. What is with her? What's wrong with her? Um, you know, et cetera. It sets up a partial personification. The commentators have noticed, noticed it, but uh, they often downplay that gender dynamic um, for, for, I think, theological reasons, it winds its way through the Quran uh, as these partially for personified male and female energies that are throughout the Quranic voice. Uh, so, so one of the things I, I find is that um, the sound and the meaning in the Quran are so intertwined that, that one, uh, it becomes really difficult to talk about one without the other. My second part is, is about Quranic spirit, ruh. There are three, the, the word spirit or ruh 
uh, cognate with Hebrew ruach, uh, appears in the Quran only about uh, 20 times, um, but always in very, very charged places. Uh, there, there are three contexts. The first context is creation. Um, the stories about the creation of Adam, God shapes the clay or the, the mud, um, in the Quran says, in the divine voice with my own two hands, and then God uh, breathes uh, of his spirit into Adam, uh, 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 to breathe out, min ruhihi, and that uh, uh, instantiates the creation. In prophecy, uh, the, the rule appears in very similar ways. So um, the, the, uh, the story of Muhammad's prophecy, uh, the surah that's often one of the most um, well-known surahs in the Quran, the surah of uh, uh, Surah Al-Qadr, uh, the night of fate or the night of power which is, um, and the, it grounds the observance at, toward the end of Ramadan of the Night of Power. Uh, that surah uh, brings up the rule and the gender dynamic and the gender energies. And I'd like to just uh, go through the Arabic and show why translations cannot uh, deal with this. Uh, I'm not a trained Quranic reciter, so um, it's not going to sound uh, right, but I can do my best. Inna anzalna hu fi laylatil qadr. And we have sent it down on the night of destiny. Or we have sent him down on the night of destiny. The who, the male uh, neuter pronoun, male slash neuter, can be either he or, or him. Um, the, if the exegetes choose him, then people say that's Gabriel, Jibril. If they choose a who, then they say, well, that's the Quranic re revelation, it, the book or the Quran. What could tell you what the night of destiny is? This is a phrase that appears throughout the Quran. What could possibly tell you what something is? And usually what the Quran does after that is give a kind of riddle or something. It doesn't really tell you what could tell you what it is. Um, what can tell you what the night of uh, power or destiny is? The night of destiny is better than a thousand months. Uh, then we have a, a break into the long rhythm. Lay little, I'm sorry, tanazalul malaikatu waruhu fiha. The angels come down. The spirit among them, or the spirit within them. Or the spirit upon her, or the spirit upon it. Bidni rabbihim min kulli amr. By the permission of the, their Lord in, in, through, through every kind of command or order. So this central phrase, waruhu fiha, forms a sound figure with numerous other uh, passages in the Quran uh, talking about this moment of revelation. The, the ha, the her or it, what is that? Um, it, it, uh, grammatically, the, the most logical place that it would go back to would be the night, Layla. Uh, that's feminine. So, uh, uh, and the, the night, the angels come down in the night, fiha, in it. Uh, but there are other possibilities that I won't go into at this moment. Then it ends this way, salamun hiya. Salamun hiya. You're probably all familiar with salamun alaikum. Peace be to you. Salamun hiya is a very is an unusual expression. Peace she or peace it is. 
depending on whether you want it gendered or non-gendered. Hatta matlal fajr. So if one reads it in the gendered way, there's a masculine being being sent down um, upon or within uh, the uh, feminine being, uh, or uh, at least grammatically gendered, night of destiny. And then in the end, there's this extraordinarily, uh, this phrase in an extraordinarily powerful and unusual position, salamun hiya. And if one reads it, reads it without the gender, it's all, uh, it came down uh, on it or during it, a uh, piece it is. And I, you know, I always find that there's a choice between over-personifying things and, and translating them as he and it, or what I would call neutering the text, um, where all this, all this powerful gender dynamic is, is, is stripped away. Third section. Uh, now I'd like to talk about uh, two modes of understanding Revelation that were clearly in tension with one another throughout this period, not only in Islam, but all the other traditions. That is the notion that revelation comes down or is sent down to the prophet, and the notion that um, uh, the prophet goes up to retrieve the revelation. Oh, before I do that, I just have to one, say the one thing. So I had the, the rule in creation and the rule in prophecy. And then there's the ruh as the Yalmuddin, the day of judgment, the day of reckoning. So uh, you have three what I would call boundary moments where the ruh is central. Even the phraseology and the sound patterns come up at the sa in the same way, often uh, subtly reversed. So in prophecy, the angels come down with the sp and the spirit uh, in the night or on the night of destiny. At the al the, the angels rise up with the spirit um, uh, uh, at the day of reckoning. But the patterns and the, and the sound patterns are extraordinarily similar. Uh, so each, in each case, the spirit, there are three primordial moments of spirit. They each en encompass one another. They appear as pr kind of uh, beginning um, a prophetic encounter with that eternity and final announcement, um, they're implicated in one another and um, uh, uh, they by the sound patterns that bring them together. So it's really hard to hear the sound patterns of one without hearing the sound patterns of the other. So the uh, the uh, coming down notion. The angels come down. Um, uh, we have sent it down. That's the coming down notion of revelation. And uh, then there's the legend or the hadith about Muhammad's mirage. There's no discussion at length about the mirage in the Quran. There's a, couple, there's a vague statement that um, uh, God took his servant uh, by night from the sacred uh, place of prayer to the furthest place of prayer. People said that was God taking Muhammad from Mecca uh, to Jerusalem, Al-Aqsa, the furthest. Um, but that is all, all that is elaborated in the Hadith, which elaborates um, a, a miraculous journey of Muhammad from Mecca to Jerusalem or from Mecca through the, uh, directly up through the seven spheres to the divine throne and then um, from what scholars have, have said, a, a kind of um, more compilated notion that Muhammad goes first to Jerusalem, There's, there he tethers his, uh, his, uh, his mount, his magic mount, Barak, and then he rises up uh, with uh, Gabriel through the heavens to the divine throne. To, in order to make, uh, and what, they, what the Quran does is it takes passages about different parts of the Quran, about the moment of revelation, and, and the hadith place it in, uh, of the mirage, place it on the ascent, Muhammad's ascent. Uh, one classic example, the kind of ur text about the Quran's talk about prophecy and its own process of prophecy, 
is the following. I'll read it in, in, in Arabic and then give a gloss. Wanajmi ida hawa. By the star, um, when it uh, falls over the horizon, according to many tra uh, trans uh, commentaries. Ma dalla sahibukum wa ma hawa. Your friend is not gone astray and he is not deluded. Wa ma yantaku on al hawa. He does not enunciation. He does not enunciate from hawa, from desire. In huwa illa wahyun yuha. It is only a revelation revealed. Allamahu shadid al qawa. That a, a powerful being has taught him. Dhu mirratin fastawa. Nobody knows what this dhu mirratin is for sure, but the common er, commentators talk about different ways of uh, its, its primary uh, uh, power and strength of this being. Um, Fastawa, and it, it um, took its place on the throne is, the, is uh, uh, what the term means in other contexts. Uh, but is it referring to uh, the angel? Is the angel taking his place on the throne or is it God? Is this a reference back up to God? Most people talk about the angel as being the powerful being that taught this to Muhammad. But if it's talking about the angel, then we have something that occurs in the Jewish Metatron tradition. So, so someone's occupying the throne, and you don't know who it is. Is that the angel? Is that God? Is that the reflection of God? Is that someone assuming the power of God? Are people that think they see that, uh, are that being on, on the throne deluded or not deluded? Wahua bil ufuk al ala. While he was at the furthest horizons, highest horizons, the heart does not lie in what it saw. Then there's another section. He saw it in another descent, Nazlatan Ukhra. At the low tree of the furthest boundary, Sidratil Muntaha. Therein is the garden of refuge or sanctuary, Jannatul Mahwa. When there came over the low tree, what came over it? Either Yagshal Siddhartha Ma Yagsha. The the gaze did not um, swerve and it did not transgress. Ma zagil basru, basaru wa ma taha. He saw the signs of his Lord, the greatest signs of his Lord. So in these cases, you have this moment of revelation um, and a vision. But what is being seen? It's, there are terms there. There's a low tree. Um, there's a furthest a, a, a garden of sanctuary. But it's completely enigmatic. And then it said the low tree was shrouded by what shrouded it. So the explanatory term reverts back on itself um, to give you no information, almost as if the language were subverting its, its own ability to talk about it. And this is, of course, God's language. So it would probably be a, you know, something God wanted to do, uh, not uh, presumably uh, difficult. The uh, Mirage tradition takes these things like the Jannah Til Mahwa, the Garden of Sanctuary, the Low Tree, and all these uh, different place, uh, uh, things that we saw or didn't quite see in this vision, and it places them on different stations of Muhammad's journey to the Divine Throne. And you have different versions saying, there in the fifth uh, heavenly sphere was the Low Tree. And you have some versions that say, no, it was in the seventh sphere. Um, now, this tension between descent and ascent uh, can be seen pulling through the uh, rabbinic and uh, um, hekelote Jewish traditions. It can be seen pulling through some of the early Christian traditions. It's in the Enoch tradition, some of which are, are uh, clearly Jewish, some of which there's discussions about whether they're Christian glosses over a Jewish tradition. 
And it's clearly there in all the mirage uh, traditions and in the Quran itself. One of the things that uh, this tension about rising up through the heavenly spheres reveals, uh, I think, is, and especially the way we can see the tension refracted among the three Abrahamic traditions, and seeing it developing. And it's, it's, I think it's hard, if not impossible, to start tracing influences. One could say the, the mirage legend is, you know, seems to be following patterns that were set by earlier texts about Enoch rising through the spheres. Uh, one could say that some of the Hecalot literature, uh, whose provenance and dates we don't know, may have been influenced by some of the early mirage traditions. Uh, there, uh, that His teacher, Bruno Latini, had a copy. Um, uh, this was first suggested by a Spanish scholar, Asin Palacios. There was this huge reaction against it for what Maria Rosa Menocal calls philological nationalist purposes. The notion that if we were influenced by one of them, they must be the more powerful and the most cultural and we're the weaker party. And that notion of influence, I think, is still contaminated by notions of active partner and passive partner. The way I look at it is that these, these contacts were going on continuously. That you had a, a Christian world, a Jewish world, an Islamic world uh, that were part of two large political realms, one ruled by Christian leaders and one ruled by um, Muslim leaders. But Jews, Christians, and Muslims were an active builders of those two different civilizations. They were, and those traditions were moving around much, much more supply than we can find in written texts, and um, it was certainly far more pervasively than maps that would say, here's the boundary would ever show. That doesn't mean that those who reflect traditions that are found in the others are necessarily being sympathetic. Um, it's clear that uh, what Palacios showed, even as early as 1914, is some of the very tortures in hell that Muhammad sees on his journey when he goes down through the lower levels. The logic of the torture is related to the crime, and some of the exact crimes and exact logic appear in the D Divine Comedy. Whether the Christians or the Muslim traditions that came up with that first doesn't really matter. I think what matters is that you have a shared cosmology. You have a shared cosmology in which the heavenly spheres, um, the Ptolemaic universe, is both astrological, physical, and symbolic. The two are not separable. People, have, this was a common heritage, and each group tried to give the version of that story that made it their own, and often this went back and forth as things developed. Uh, one of the things that you see in these is a three uh, is another tension not um, that's within each of the traditions between or among three different ways of viewing prophecy and salvation. I call them the angelic, the humanistic, and the intellectual. And th there are certain cues I think that are are quite easily recognizable. If the if the uh, Controllers of the spheres or the heavens are intellects, as in Aristotle. And if the, the ascender has to pass intellectual tests and, and, and show gradations of intellect, um, and ultimately rising to meet the active intellect or however it's viewed, which is Gabriel. The philosophers saw Gabriel as the active intellect and the lowest of the divine intellects in, in uh, in the Quran, in the uh, um, Aristotelian tradition, that's the intellectual tradition. If the uh, angels are in control of the spheres and like, then that's what I would call a spiritualist version. If human prophets are in the spheres and the uh, person rising up is not only not becoming more angelic, but is actually in a ferocious competition with the angels, uh, that, and, the, and the human being is privileged and wins out, I call that the um, humanist version. 
the ferocious, uh, uh, you know, we think of angels as kind of nice cherubic figures. They were really not, uh, uh, they were really quite scary. And, you know, whether one is talking about the cherubim, we talk about cherubs now, but the cherubim were not something you wanted to get too close to in the, in the biblical tradition or, um, and that there were equivalents in the Islamic tradition. So, and there's the, what I call the fee fi fo fum moment. Um, <laughs> there's uh, both in the Hekelot, the Jewish traditions, the Rabbinic traditions, the Hekelot traditions, and in uh, traditions of uh, mirage and Sufi mirage, there's an angel that says something, well, at one point he says, I can smell a human being from 365,000 parasangs. And so and then all of a sudden he confronts, whether it's Muhammad or Enoch or whoever it says, and what are you doing in the pure land? You, and then often there's a rant about you uh, mortal being that spills blood and that has pus and uh, all this kind of anti, we are the angels, we are light. Heard fee fi fo fum, of course, is what the giant says when Jack and Beanstalk is rising up. And I, I'd forgotten, what does it rhyme with? And it's a fee fi fo fum, I smell the blood of an Englishman. And I was thinking, hmm, I wonder if that comes from an Irish tradition or something. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the mirage is clearly in the human category in the sense that um, in, in each uh, level, there's a, a prophet, uh, usually starting with Adam, Ab ending with Abraham. And in each case, the angels challenge Muhammad and uh, say, what are you doing here? And there's a word coming, he's been called for, he's been sent, or he's been chosen uh, clearly by God. The next section, uh, poetic notions of lyricism and prophecy. Here I need to read some poetic verses um, to give a sense of, of how this would work. Uh, let me start out by reading uh, some verses of poetry that is attributed to the pre-Islamic period and to the very, very early Islamic period. But as I do, let me acknowledge something. Uh, I view uh, early histories of religions somewhat the way I would imagine scient scientists view trying to find the origin of a galaxy. The closer you get to the black hole, the more your instruments are being warped by the power of what's happening. And the closer you get back to the origins of these traditions, the more the whole, the whole environment has been so pervaded and changed that it becomes very difficult. What we think is pre-Islamic poetry, what is um, said to be pre-Islamic poetry, what is said to be the Quran and the traditions of Muhammad were all collected and written down long after uh, at least 100 to 150, uh, in some cases 200 years after the fact. It was all um, passed down by oral uh, tradition. And um, so that the process of developing the science of Arabic, developing the grammar, developing the script, developing categories of, of analyzing the meters of the poetry, um, analyzing the Quran. Often the books about the Quran were also books about poetry. They'd say a verse from the Quran. They said, well, how do we know what the Arabic is? Here's a verse of the poem. And then, I, 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 you know, bless their hearts, they're saying we're only reading this poetry because we have to understand the Quran. They'll go on to maybe 30 or 40 pages, digressing on the poem and all the great things of the poem. Then they'll say, it's like, oh yeah, back to the Quran. So the collection of the poetry, the collection of the Quran was part of the same extraordinary endeavor that occurred over centuries. So when I say pre-Islamic uh, or when I say Quranic, uh, you know, I don't take any position on exactly what happened. 10 minutes, thank you. So a couple poems, I'll mention them. Uh, I'll sum up and then let's have some discussion. So here's, um, uh, here's the first poem I'll read. This is uh, from uh, Labid, who is said to have lived to the time of Muhammad. It starts out with the core lyrical moment in Arabic, which is the remembrance of the uh, the recognition of the traces of the campsite of the lost beloved. And in the early Arabic 
uh, poetry, there was a, a convention where everybody understood that you didn't have to say what happened. Uh, the lover and the beloved were separated. Maybe they were different tribes that would come together at spring campground season or for pilgrimages that would break up. The love affairs would be ended. And then the voice is always of the lost, the, the lover uh, yearning and remembering the, the beloved and, and the happiness time was spent with her and her absence. The name places are going to be the stations of the beloved. So the lover remembers the stations of her leaving. These stations, Mokamat or Manazal, are also the terms that are used for stations on the pilgrimage. And there's almost a ritual quality about the remembrance. The tent marks in Minin are worn away where she encamped and where she alighted. Gal and Rejam left to the wild, and the naked and the torrent beds of Ryan, naked tracings worn thin like inscriptions carved in flattened stones. So often the, the traces of the beloved's campsite are like um, marks made around a tent to keep a, a trench to keep flooding, or the tent marks that were made, and the the the, the erosion wears them away, but it somehow it also reveals them. There's some kind of a uh, dialectic going on. Dung-stained ground that tells the years past since human presence. Months of peace gone by, months of war. Then there's something that happens throughout Arabic in the Quran and the poetry, where uh, the, the past and the active invocative are the same kind of word. So replenished by the rain stars. It can be, let the rain stars replenish, or it can mean it was replenished by the rain stars. Uh, replenished by the rain stars of spring and struck by thunderclap downpour or steady fine drop silken rains from every kind of cloud passing at night, darkening the morning or rumbling in peals across the evening sky. The white pond crest is shot upward and on the wadi slopes gazelles among their newborn and ostriches, and the wide of eyes. Uh, this is one of many epithets. I try not to translate epithets as, as nouns because the whole point is that there's no noun. So you put it together like a cubist painting or something, you get these epithets. But it, just a cheat, it refers to the dooryks uh, with the very wide eyes and, the, and the, it's a common feature. Silent above monthling fawns on the open terrain yearlings cluster. The rills and runlets uncovered marks like the script of faded scrolls restored with reeds of pen, pens of reed or tracings of a tattoo woman beneath the indigo powder sifted in spirals the form begins to reappear. I stop to question them. How is one to question? Deaf, immutable, inarticulate stones. So this, this questioning of the ruins, the questioning of the stones, the word for the stones is khawalit, which can mean the, the, the blackened hearthstones on which the cooking uh, pot was kept in the camp. And it also has the word of eternity within it. Um, you question them. They are signs of the beloved. They are signs of her presence, they are signs of her absence. You question them, they will never give you an answer. But questioning them is crucial. And the moment of the poetic voice is what I would call the moment of recognition. The moment that the, the poet stops to tell his companions, there's something about this old campsite, I have to get down and look, and they're like, what's his problem? And he gets down off the camel, and he's gazing at this, and then there's the moment when these aren't just any traces in the sand. Um, these are, this is uh, the, the trace of the lost beloved's campsite. That moment of recognition then is, uh, it's, it's often called the moment of vicar or remembrance. That moment is, unleashes the flood voice of, of uh, the poetic expression. I'd like to read one more uh, quick version from early Arabic poetry, then a later poem from uh, the medieval tradition, uh, 12th century, and then take your questions. This poem uh, is uh, by Dhurumma. <coughs> Maya is the beloved. Oh. 
to the encampments of Myrus be over you still, and the rains of the Pleiades pouring down and spreading, though it was you who stirred a lover's disheartened desire, until the eyes shed tears, yes, that nearly on knowing a campsite as Maya's, if not released, would have killed. Um, I'll just recite that little bit in Arabic. Amenzilate mayin salamun alaykuma ala na'i wa na'i ya waddu wa yansahu. Wa ma zala min naut ismaki alaykuma wa naut ithuraya wa abilun mutabattahu. Wa in kuntuma qad hijtuma Rajil Hawa let the Shalki at the Lalatil Ainu Tasfu Ajal Abratan Cad at the Irfani Menzilata the Mayata Menzilatin the Mayata La Lem Tusil Ilma Tadbahu. Then he goes on, though I was already nearing 30, 30 and my friends had learned better and good news had begun to weigh down folly. Yeah, it's, I'm too old to be falling in love like this and weeping over abodes, etc. When distance turns other lovers, the first premonition of loving Maya will still be with me. Nearness to her cannot impoverish desire nor distance, wherever she may be, run it dry. The inner whisper of memory, reminiscence of Maya, is enough to bruise your heart. Desires have their way, circulate freely, but I can't see your share of my heart given away. Though in parting some love is effaced and disappears, Yours in me is made over and compounded. You came to mind when a doe aerial passed us, right flank turned to the camel mounts, neck lowered, a doe of the sands, earth hued with white blaze on the forehead and the forenoon sun clear upon her back. She leaves her fawn on a dune, a grassy dune in Mushrif, the glance of her eye gleaming around him gazing at us as if we intended harm or we would meet him, approaching us, then backing away. She is her like in shoulder, neck, and eye, but Maya is more radiant than she, still more beautiful. In conclusion, what happens in the nasib or the remembrance of the lost beloved? Uh, you have um, a uh, invocation of the beloved um, at this moment of recognition, an, a recognition that is so powerful that it were not for the burst of tears, it would have killed the person who, rec who makes the recognition. In the Quran, if Moses, if Moses had looked at, at God when God said he would unveil his face, he would have been obliterated like the mountainside around him that was. And, and actually, in the Arabic poetic tradition, Moses is one of the great lovers. Because Moses was willing to even ask to, to go through this experience. Um, and there's often the boasts about the poetic lover. The poet is majnoon. The poet is crazy. The poet is everything that the Quran says it's not. A majnoon Layla, the figure that comes to be, that inspired uh, um, uh, through the Persian version, um, Eric Clapton's Layla, and not to mention a million other poets throughout history, is known to wander about the waddies, love lost in every waddy. He sees Layla everywhere. He sees a rock, he says Layla. He sees a tree, he says Layla. His friend says, don't try to help him, he's too far gone now. He, he perishes uh, in the desert for Layla. He is annihilated. Um, and in that annihilation for Sufis, that becomes the moment when the human soul becomes empty of its own uh, uh, images and the image of God fills it and it becomes one with God. And at that moment, uh, a Hadith says, God becomes, God says, I become the hearing with which he hears, the seeing with which he sees, etc." In many of the ways we talked about prophetic and poetic in Brenda's talk. 
And um, from Ibn al-Arabi to Hafiz in the later tradition, you can hear this powerful persona. This is the voice that, as one Ottoman poet says, the, the meanings of reality are made clear in my words, but concealed by them. The very um, foundations of the earth shake in my speech. Um, so this notion of, then of the poetic and the prophetic as being um, in this ex extraordinary situation of parallel but separate um, uh, and the, the very process of creating, of uh, writing down the Quran, even though the Quran says all this stuff and poets, loving women that aren't your wife, drinking wine, all this stuff is forbidden. All this was jahiliya, fighting tribal wars, heroic boasts. They, they took all this down meticulously and it was part of the tradition, much the way I think Christians did with Ovid and Virgil. You know, it wasn't supposed to be the right thing, but it became deeply important. So let's uh, take some questions. I do want to read this poem at some point, but I know I've gone probably to my 10 minutes. So shall we read it now, or you're the, you're the master here. I, ask, I defer to you. Why don't you read it for us, and then we'll have questions. Okay. So here's a poem from Ibn uh, This is from a, uh, uh, a set of poems called Turjaman al Ashwak, which can mean translator of desires, interpreter of desires, or biographer of desires. At the rock plains near the bend of the trail is the place of meeting. Kneel your camels, its waters are home. Don't go crying lightning, Thahmud, Hajar, hankering after. Um, let me just mention that Hajar is one of the stations in, in, of the beloved in Ibn al -Arabi. It's also the name of the town Madat in Saleh, which is where um, when the people uh, refused to give water to the camel mirror of God um, and disobeyed their prophet Saleh, uh, God destroyed them um, and, the, and the town became utterly obliterated. And for Ibn al-Arabi in his commentaries at least, that's the moment of the obliteration of the self in Fana, in passing away in mystical union. Don't go, but as stations of beloved, the voices, you know, this is the voice of waking up. Snap out of it, man. There's always a voice of, oh, the lost beloved, when she was there, and then the, death, the, the wasteland turns to a garden. And from the pre-Islamic poets right down to the present, the beloved, the description of the beloved, which purports to describe her, uh, her mouth is like, wine imported from distant Persia, kept in the, a stopper jug for a thousand years, a vintage as old as Enoch, a vintage older than the creation of the universe, the best vintage ever. Um, all these, you know, kind of long, digressive similes. They don't end up, if all these beloveds, Layla and Maya, and they all came into the room, we say, and they have this description, was. What the description of the beloved? They all came in. No one would have a clue of which one was which. <laughs> so, so it sets up this elaborate notion that you're being a beloved is being described. What is often always depicted, I think, by the end is a lush garden, and I think the the lost garden is the symbolic analog of the beloved in all these passages. So, by the time you get to the end of extended similes, which tell you nothing about the object of direct desire or gaze, you end up with a, a, a rich depiction of the flowing garden, the gazelles, the animals giving birth in peace and tranquility, the pond crests, uh, pond crests sprouting up. Of course, the, 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 the poet is in the desert. And so here he is living in this garden. And, and so his friends and his own poetic voice is saying, you're crazy, you're dreaming, snap out of it. You got a long journey ahead of you. People die out here. And so you have the wake up man voice and then the voice of remembrance and they're always pulling at each other. It often takes the poet four or five efforts to snap himself out of the, the remembrance. So here's a kind of snap out of a voice. Don't do this. Then it says, revel like maidens, breast curves alluring or gazelles that slow to graze and wander. These, these references to breast curves and all that, it's all out of Quranic discussions of paradise. And people are saying that can't be in the Quran about discussions of paradise. 
it must be borrowed. There's a book that says it must be borrowed from Syriac texts because it makes no sense. So I'm saying if you know if the Quran and and Arabic poetry are at the same time, this is the language the poets had. You know, this was the language of the uh, uh, the remembrance of the beloved and the consolation for the beloved was all about this. While the fly hums softly in the meadow as the songbirds trills reply. Delicate the fringe of the garden, tender the spring breeze, the cloud lit from within by lightning, thunder rumbles the dark sky. Rains burst like tears of a lover, torn asunder from the one he loves. Drink this ancient wine, drink deeply. Let the spell of its song take you. Wine of the age of Adam, bearing word down the generations from the garden of sanctuary, Jannat al Mahwa. This wine, sweet as a rush of musk, wine I've tasted on the lips, elixir kiss of senoras and senorinas. English doesn't have any good vocabulary for talking about married women and female married women. I have to borrow from another language, um, you know, to talk about, you know, the way it's usually translated from, you know, unmarried maidens and w married women or something. It just doesn't work in the Arab context. Uh, so thank you. I look forward to any discussion. I would like to ask you, maybe tomorrow we can continue this discussion. Sure. I want to talk about the Hebrew poetic traditions mm -hmm. and how those also play into this mm -hmm. Quranic tradition. So that was the first thing, and that's just for a thought. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, your basic idea about connection between prophecy and poetry, of course, links the three traditions mm -hmm. uh, very profoundly, right. as it is, you know, the prophets and uh, the Hebrew scriptures. And, um, and Dante, of course, in that tradition. So that's another you know, big thing to, for us to think about. Now, then you mentioned Dante and Islam, and you trod on my territory there. Uh -huh. So I have to still say a few things about that. Sure. Um, because Palacios, you know, early part of the 20th century, Cheruli uh, was ambassador to Persia mm -hmm. uh, during the 30s and 40s, and he was uh, absolutely convinced that Dante knew a version of the Mirage. Mm -hmm. So I do have a question, about, because there are so many versions of the Mirage. Right. There are a number of them in the West. Right. There's no question about that. Yeah. There's a Latin version, mm -hmm. there's a French version, there's a Castilian version. Mm -hmm. That certainly, I, my belief about Dante is if it existed, he had read it because mm. he read everything. He was mm. an omnivore right. and he would never have been closed minded about it right. because of its provenance. Right. Already it's been translated into Latin anyway right. and in, into other Romance languages. But um, there's a really close connection for Dante because Monte Croce who was from the Church of the Mirage in his work that he brought back to Florence. So, and he gave lectures. I mean, Santa Maria Novella was a place for people to um, come from Dominican, you know, he's mm. a Dominican, so right. he went there to work. Dante yeah. frequented right. uh, Santa Maria Novella regularly. Right. So uh, there's no question that he would have come across it through Monte Croce, which is right on top of him. Mm -hmm. But my question is, these versions in the West, and I have right. published on a few, are all in prose. Right. So it's true you have a Lex, uh, you know, right. Lex Taliorum, right. and you have, you know, the, the Palacio's argument was the light metaphysics and all of this. You have light metaphysics in the West, too. Right. So, I mean, these are shared traditions. Sure, of That's course. my yeah. issue here. Yeah. But are there poetic versions of the Mirage in Arabic? 
because the ones that come into the West are right. all in prose. Yeah. There's not. There's no poetry in any of them. Right. Um, there's similes and metaphors. Yes. Right. But right. Not Yes, I mean, um, uh, and someone correct me if, if I'm wrong, but the Mirage tradition grows out of these hadith. They were in prose, and, the, and they're in a prose that is not in the kind of poetic way that the Quran is a poetic prose. It's more of a, a narrative style prose. And um, you get a lot of Persian and, and Ottoman and Turkish versions of, the, of, of uh, uh, Mirage type scenes in uh, people like Farid ad-Din Attar, uh, who was the, about the time of Ibn al-Arabi, 12th century. Um, but I don't know of any equivalents in Arabic that would take the mirage as such and put it into a poetic form, although you have poetic refractions of the, of the tropes of the mirage that are brought in. Uh, so um, as far as I know, there's, there's no Arabic Mo uh, certainly, there's no Arabic model I know of that that uh, Dante would have known of uh, that would have been uh, translated into Latin or anything else in, in any kind of poetic poetic modality. As far as um, I see Palacios, let me say I think a lot of his argumentation was about the light method, metaphysics, and, and and things. I think that was a stretch. Uh, I never found that to be particularly convincing. Um, and and I, my point is I don't think it proves, it, it just proves that I think all that we know from the discoveries of the uh, various versions since that time that you mentioned in the Castilian, the Latin, and the French, I didn't know about this uh, Dominican uh, text, um, that all of, all of this material was going back and forth. And probably the most interesting connections we won't have the text for. You know, the, so um, I certainly agree with that. Back on the Hebrew issue, I think there's some, uh, let, let me just mention uh, two extraordinary uh, uh, aspects of it. First of all, this poem by Ibn al Arabi and the other 61 poems in the Turjan Manal Ashwak, they're criticized. People say, you're a religious leader. You're talking about elixir kisses and, and drinking this wine and all this stuff. You know, and, and so then he wrote a, an allegorical commentary on his own poem. <laughs> you know, saying, no, no, this is not the real wine. And the elixir kiss is the, uh, you know, and it, it actually fits into his greater uh, metaphysics, uh, metaphysical writings, his symbolic cosmology and his, his mystical psychology. It's not completely arbitrary, but it doesn't do any justice to the deep, poetic tradition that he's been drawing on because, because he knows that would be controversial. And in many ways, I think that his own process of self-commentary is very similar to the kind of commentaries that were written on the Song of Songs. And um, you see the same kind of commentary traditions on Rumi and Hafez and arguments about whether, the same arguments that exist today about whether the Song of Songs is a, is a, a you know, a love of God uh, poem or a love, a human love poem. Those arguments have existed throughout the Islamic tradition. And one of the things I find most interesting is the poems that are most loved are the ones, in many cases, that don't give that away in the poem. They, and they raise the question very provocatively. Um, Rumi says, by God, I drank a wine last night that I won't drink until the day of resurrection. Or it made me so drunk I won't wake up till the day of resurrection. So he said, whoa. And you know, Hafiz says, uh, he is an infidel to love who will not worship wine. Um, well, not only is, are you worshiping something other than God, presumably, unless you read it in a certain way, but you're worshiping that which is most polluting and most sinful. Um, so he puts, he gets all the scandal in there in one little verse. <laughs> and uh, actually, a, a guzzle like this came out by Ayatollah Khomeini, and it was published in the New York Times in translation. You know, uh, forget the words of the preacher, get me drunk in the tavern, let me lie on the floor and wallow in the dust. And people are saying, oh, you know, this doesn't make sense, and it makes perfect sense in the tradition. Nobody has a problem with it until. The revolution came, and the Shah's people accused Khomeini of being like a profligate, and uh. you know. And then after that, nobody would talk about this aspect of Khomeini because it became part of the polemic. Uh, the other aspect about the Hebrew is 
that in the golden age of Hebrew poetry, of, of Hebrew secular poetry, which happened under Islamic Andalus primarily, you have these amazing figures. Of, I have to mention this figure, um, Shmuel Hanagid. One of these figures, that you, you just can't believe it. It seems to be true. He was the leader of his religious community, the Nagid. He was um, the vizier for the uh, uh, Sultan of uh, Cordoba. He was the, the, the major general who wrote uh, extraordinary odes uh, to his, his, in the heroic Arabic model to his victories. He was a great love poet in the Arabic tradition. He pioneered, along with others, how to write Hebrew poetry in Arabic-style meters. He invented the, the way, the metrics for the Hebrew poetry. And he has poems that could be right out of the remembrance of the lost beloved in the garden, etc. He uses these Bedouin themes. And then he mixes that with the biblical themes. And they developed a way of being both completely immersed in the Arabic poetic tradition, and they immersed it as well in the Bible. And this went on for several generations, Moses, Ibn Ezra, Judah Halevi, other great poets. And um, you know, it, it, it's just one of the remarkable uh, aspects in, in world history. And you look back at a figure like uh, Shmuel Hanagin, um, big job. Uh, he was a, a, a vizier. And he was a scholar who made all these uh, grammatical breakthroughs, revitalized the Hebrew language as a poetic language, and was one of the great poets um, uh, looking back in, in, uh, in the tradition that I'm talking about. Uh, so I think that that is just one glimmer of discussion about the Hebrew connection. Other questions or thoughts? Oh, there was one back there, I think. Uh, In your talk, you're talk, you were explaining how the Quran has all these stylistic and formal means uh, joining uh, form to context. Mm -hmm. You're describing this. And of course, that's not unique to the Quran or Arabic literature. That's, that's pretty common in, in uh, most traditions, probably all. You know? um, so my question was, within, within the Quran, if there, are, um, if there are devices, formal devices that are common to either thematic discussions, or, or if they can be traced according to uh, the periods that the Quran was, um, that the Quran was written. Right. So the Medina, the Medina yeah. period, or when the Quran is talking about creation, does it, does it use certain devices does it, when it's talking about uh, war and battle? Does it use certain devices judgment? So that was, that was a question. Fairly uh, natural, great question. Uh, yeah. Let me say that uh, if we trust the traditional chronologies from the Muslim scholars, where they divide things into Meccan and, and Medina and early Meccan, late Meccan periods, the early Meccan verses are what I would call the hymnic role. Uh, they're sh they're, the surahs are short, uh, universal themes. That is, you don't have to know tribal history. You don't have to know the names of the characters that were Muhammad was fighting with. You don't have to know any of this historical background to basically read something like, in translation, um, you know, uh, uh, when, uh, when the skies are torn from the heavens, when the stars are strewn, when the seas boils, boil over, when the tur uh, tombs burst open, then a soul will know what she has uh, given and what she has held back. Oh, human being, what has led you from your generous Lord? That kind of hymnic, um, apocalyptic modality is considered to be uh, the central early Meccan theme. And uh, the, uh, the uh, creation, the rule passages, and the, the, what I would call the sound uh, figures that link them, they're found in all three, all the major periods. And uh, they can occur in the short uh, uh, Meccan style discourse, or they can appear in these longer, uh, more discursive lines in the late Medinan discourse, but they appear in, in kind of powerful lyrical modalities breaking into the text. We have time for one more question. Yes. Um, I was struck by uh, words of power. 
right? Um, I was struck by how so much of the power is, is in the sound and the, and the, the poetic modality. Mm -hmm. um, is it true, would it be true to say that the, the power of the Quran is revealed much more in the recitation than in, say, exegesis? That, that exegesis matters less for Arabic theology than recitation, or and matters less than for Christian theology where exegesis is a central activity and recitation of the, script, of the text is not nearly so central? Um, you know, it's a wonderful question, and I, I can't um, make a, a global statement about mattering less or more. Mm -hmm. I think uh, certainly um, you know, the, the whole history of, uh, of, of people uh, learning the Quran has started with the assumption that to learn it, you have to interiorize it, um, even memorize it. Uh, it becomes kind of part of your circulation. And at that point, then people go on to exegesis. Mm -hmm. uh, the exegetes do not talk at de in detail about the kind of things I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that, re that protocol is quite interesting. They'll talk about Ijaz al-Quran. It's mostly anecdotal. The Quran was so powerful, it made even Omar weep. You know, Omar the great general, etc. Um, they give dozens of anecdotal statements about the power of the sound of the Quran. And they talk about its, its narrative power and the greatness of its story. But they don't talk about what I would call this poetics aspect in any kind of elaborated exegetical detail uh, that I know of. Um, so uh, I think you're, I, I'd just like to leave your question as a, uh, a great question. Um, we're actually hoping to pro set up at Chicago a program in uh, comparative exegesis of, because uh, the Quran and Christian and Muslim exeg exegetes were influencing one another constantly, to set up a program in comparative exegesis that might even get close to you know, taking that question seriously and, and doing something with it. I did want to make, m mention just a, c a couple things that um, I'd like to say to, to kind of tie these, uh, these points together about, um, about the, uh, the Quran and the poetry. Just to refer, just to kind of give a nod to the unfortunate polemical world we live in today. Uh, there was this, you know, this mention, I, uh, I mentioned of a, of a book that said that the wine and uh, the virgins and the, and the maidens with swelling breasts and, and uh, the, the large of eyes, uh, the ayin, um, and the huris, which is a word in the Quran, uh, hur, which in Arabic means flashing black and white, black against white, and it's usually referred to the the captivating. Later, um, in the polemic now, these are the virgins, and then people say there's a 72 virgins that are given as a reward, as a sexual favor for those who carry out suicide uh, bomb, bomb attacks. And when this German scholar came up and said, you know, this solves all the problem. First of all, the Quran makes no sense as you read it, because it makes no sense that they would have the Quran talking about all these um, of, of virgins and wine and all this stuff in description of paradise. Because paradise has to be chased, it has to be, you know, and the idea that there would be erotic love or even sexuality paradise is absurd. And none of this stuff uh, makes any sense in Arabic. It's got to have come from Syriac hymns that were misunderstood by Muhammad. And he changed different words. So he says the word for uh, large eyes really means white raisins. and and he, and on the grapes are white raisins. So the new, Newsweek he headline said, um, uh, you know, it was uh, all this kind of sarcasm. Um, suicide bombers, uh, juicy virgins, or white grapes. <laughs> and this got around. It was in the Guardian magazine in England. And the, the statements that were made, uh, this scholar, Christoph Luxemburg, who actually has some interesting things to say, um, has is a, written the most important work of Quranic studies ever. And this is, you know, people are talking about it on American TV and saying, this will solve the problem in the Middle East. You know, um, and first of all, they're thinking there's 72 virgins. There's not 72 virgins in the Quran. There's not 70 virgins in the Quran. They're not, there's no promise for people that can carry out violent jihad of anything in particular in the Quran. There's promises to people that do good works. 
Um, all that stuff about the 72 virgins comes in one subset of hadith. And there's two versions in the scholar that does that, Tirmidhi. One says that these 72 virgins are, are for everyone, and one says that they're only for martyrs. So he's not even consistent. But everyone assumes they're in the Quran. And, uh, but the greatest assumption is that you can't have wine and, and um, <laughs> large-eyed beauties and flashing eyes in a depiction of paradise. That would be crude. And it goes back to an old polemic uh, uh, between uh, Christianity and Islam about whether uh, you know um, a paradise should have any discussion of anything that is quote sensual or uh, or not, and um, my my and and the, the assumption that somehow um, Muhammad would not have had access to any of this vocabulary in the Quran. All the poems I read from the pre-Islamic period had all that vocabulary. They had the wide of eyes. That was that Doloric eye that I talked about. They had the flashing eyes the, of the black versus the white, and they, you know, this. And in the in the poetic tradition, why is that? It's embraced. The poet I, poem I read by Ibn Larvi about elixir kiss. It's all grounded in Surah Al Rahman and other poems of the Quran. Why would this be embraced by? Uh, not just Sufis, but across the poetic tradition in Islam, is it? It had there was no disconnect, um, because for the poets, longing is infinite, and longing for the beloved is the closest that a human being can come to a, 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 what, uh, and of what the infinite is, because the. The human being can describe the beloved. She slips beyond the language. The human being can get close to the beloved. If the human being is with the beloved, he's so out of himself that he can't remember it. If he's not, and if he remembers it, then she, he's already separate. There are all these paradoxes. She is the uh, uh, cure. She is the disease. This longing that, that is infinite then becomes um, a, a perfect uh, uh, alignment with a, a kind of longing for the divine source and the notion that the Quran would have had these aspects of a, of a kind of vision of some, some kind of uh, vision that instead of occurring before in the past, all that stuff is what the poet remembers in the notion that somehow there was a problem with the Quran um, uh, of that aspect never occurred. Uh, to Muslim scholars, and um, if if uh, the notion that somehow that's all that vocabulary, all those images, all those conventions are are wrong or or didn't exist, then that means that all of the pre-Islamic poetic tradition was invented. Uh, and I, I I say you know, it's like people students say Homer didn't write Homer, um, uh, you know, on the lips of uh, the blips. I say. If, if a bunch of people got together in 8th century or 9th century Aleppo and invented this vocabulary with 10,000 epithets for the, the uh, camel mare, this elaborate poetics, and then covered up every trace of the invention, that is a miracle that's just as extraordinary <laughs> as the uh, jazz that we can at least as humans see within the Quranic text. So in either case, it's a remarkable story. <laughs> Thank you very much.